We've got a very interesting application here for Spark. A little bit about deep life. The deep life is we do deep submicron ASIC design. You see the background. Oh. The background of the slide I have in front of me <laughs> has an image of a silicon chip. It's also in your handout. And this will have 100 million transistors, all custom laid out. They have to work first time because a deep submicron chip it costs about a million dollars to get a set of face masks at nine months. So if you make one error on one line of code, it's going to cost, by the time you found the error, verified, resubmitted, it's going to cost us a year and a half and several million dollars for every error we make. And because of that, the whole infrastructure within DeepLine for uh, mission critical and safety critical designs has been very well established. Do the ASICs, the electronics, mechanics, the test fixturing, verification, and the software. And today, particularly, I'm going to talk about the software that's used in these systems. This is quite an interesting application. Electronic life support. These units are used by divers, different types of divers. They probably saw Jack Cousteau films where a chap's got a cylinder on his back, he breathes in, breathes out, and bubbles go to the surface. The problem with that is it uses vast amounts of gas at depth. Every time you breathe in, if we're at 100 meters, for example, use 10 times more gas on the surface, 11, time, 11 times. If most people are interested in uh, doing commercial diving work, there are severe problems in doing that at the depths that are used for uh, oil infrastructure, that are used for uh, ship inspections, many different areas. So we have a rebreather. Rebreather recirculates the gas. So we breathe out, and we breathe out roughly 4% carbon dioxide. And we breathe in, we're breathing 20% oxygen, and we're burning up roughly about 4% of that. So what the rebreather does is it takes away the carbon dioxide and puts back the oxygen. Well, the system on the diver you have here, you see the modern dive support vessel. It looks like a James Bond environment. You have these two bells, all computer operated, run by consoles similar to one on the right. The diver is treated almost like an ROV. And the screenshots look like as if he's an ROV almost. He's got on him this equipment that does the recirculation of the gas, the rebreather, and its job is to, to add the oxygen, remove the carbon dioxide, make sure there's no other toxic gases in the loop, make sure he's warm. It takes about a kilowatt of gas heating to keep him warm at these depths, because he's in four degrees centigrade water. And his breathing gas, right next to where he's breathing, has to have about 600 watts of heating, and not to cook the diver. Uh, no flooding, it's quite difficult to breathe water. Uh, provide video and voice comms. The better the quality, then the faster the job can be done. Provide respiratory monitoring and breath-by-breath -breath data logging. So that's what it has to do. And to do that, there's 62 sensors, five actuators, uh, novel actuators, uh, which have their issues because one can't pick items off the shelf, unfortunately. There's a SIL-3 to SIL-4 control system. So we've got an FPGA or ASIC and a microcontroller. For redundancy, there's five different power supplies. You need at least one of them. The diver thermal control, the diver head-up displays. So if he loses communications with the surface, there's voice enunciation that cuts in, and there's a head-up head -up display that tells him what to do, what the problem is, and what to do about it. There's high-integrity communications to the surface, uh, quad-redundant, optical, and copper. We can't just use a canvas uh, to get these seal levels. Uh, and there's a, a cockpit data processing and display. So you've got on these consoles images that look like something from the 
uh, sick bay of the Star Trek Enterprise and other ones that look like these ROV screens. So that's the whole setup. Now, these are different components. So we have the suit. If I can operate this thing. We have the suit, keep him warm. Currently, if a diver loses his uh, heating in his suit, he cannot get two meters before he's frozen to death. Yeah. The amount of heat loss in four degrees centigrade water with a hot water suit, when you're breathing helium, it's almost just pumping the heat out of your body. So if you lose that uh, water supply currently, in the current systems that are out there, you freeze in uh, literally seconds. The diver himself has this rebreather. If we give him too much oxygen, he's going to uh, die extremely quickly. If we can tolerate oxygen up to about uh, 1.6 bar, more than that, you have convulsions. So strong that the diver can throw off that helmet, which is bolted to his neck. If we don't put in enough oxygen, he just passes out. Because when we breathe, we don't know how much oxygen we're breathing. We know how much carbon dioxide we're breathing. That makes us want to breathe. But we can reduce the amount of oxygen, and the diver is totally unaware of it. The expression is one breath from death. You breathe, the next breath, you're dead. If he's breathing a gas without oxygen, you can't even get the diver back to life because the cells inside the lungs don't have a normal blood supply. They die, and the diver can't be recovered. So it's very important, these critical functions. And so there's an umbilical. This is a modern, this is one of our systems. It's got a small umbilical. Currently, the diver's got to tow about this umbilical about three inches in diameter everywhere he goes. This goes to a diving bell, and that keeps them under pressure. They live under pressure. And then there's all the electronics on the top side, especially servers, high integrity data servers. And for display, it's literally web browsers, because you can't rely on them, so you have to allow one to go down and just open another one straight away. They lose all of the uh, power systems in the ship. They can even still just call the system up on a mobile phone, and you can see at least what's going on. So it's quite an interesting system. Used by police, military, and sports divers. So this picture's not very really good, but you, here you can see a 700 kilo tuna right next to um, myself testing out one of these systems. And the fish are not scared of you at all. Because there's no noise, there's no bubbles, you're a fish. And it's because of that, sports divers like you breathers. You can go for very long durations. This is a police diver. He's a uh, about to go into um, a cave as part of dive training on the system. With that configuration here, he's able to be in that cave for about five hours. If he's working really, really hard, it'll still keep him alive for two, three hours. He's got a small tank for bailing out. But so the time to crit from criticality to failure varies from seconds to minutes. Diver is completely dependent on it working and working correctly. So the starting point for this project is comparable to doing an avionics project. Very, very similar, subsystem for subsystem. The rebreather demands, uh, instead of the DO standards, it requires IC 61508 CIL3. So uh, avionics systems usually go between SIL2, SIL3 border, and here it's required for high SIL3. <clears throat> the, the breather's got more sensors, and it's got novel actuators. Things like uh, variable orifice gas injectors, which are laser monitored with imaging systems to check the opposition of the orifice. Or another one, a bailout device. We couldn't use stepper motors, DC motors, you name it, memory wire had to be developed from scratch and put through millions of cycles of, of test under conditions to 350 meters. The rebreather's got much less space and power, and it's got much less time and a small budget. So literally, from the actuator, the node, 
which is an API to be an actuator node having an FPGA and a microcontroller. The comms, in, in this case, very high integrity comms, uh, exhaustively verified. Through to the cockpit systems, where avionics might pull off a wind river multitasking system to run it. Here, I can't do that. It has to be something which is a TTA, TTA time triggered architecture from one end through to the other. Now, the starting point, unfortunately, is worse than a blank piece of paper. Uh, commercial divers and military divers have had fairly good rebreathers, but uh, amateur divers have looked at this area, and well-meaning amateurs, and thought, oh, I can do that. My job's a salesman, perhaps. I'm a salesman, I've never been to engineering college, and I can design the electronics and the software. Well, unfortunately, companies done, have done that, and there's an accident rate of one in th 34 sold on units that have been sold by 1,000. That makes it a, a, a much worse than a blank bit of paper to start the project. Uh, we bought some of these systems and found they would hang. So what's my oxygen level? Well, it says it's perfectly good. It's not injecting oxygen. It's hung. Why is it hung? We look at it. Watchdog timer. It hasn't got one. Uh, the brownout circuit. Well, it's running off batteries designed for a camera, replaceable. And it has no brownout circuit. These are basic things. So we're starting from an industry on one side is, has, is very professional, military and commercial. The other side is uh, more challenging. And particularly, they vehemently oppose functional safety standards with a vigor that's very similar to the tobacco industry in 1975. So this is a very interesting, challenging project. 